Hello and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is Bob Power and on behalf of OTC Markets, we're very pleased you've joined us for our next live presentation from Rockfort Therapeutics, PLC. Before I introduce our speaker, a few points to note. Please submit your questions in the question box to the left of the slides. If you're interested in scheduling a meeting with Rockfort Therapeutics, please click on the meetings tab found on the left navigation bar. You'll be able to view the company's availability and submit a meeting request. On a final note, all of today's presentations will be recorded and available for 24 seven replay. At this point, I'm very pleased to welcome Ajahn Reginald, Chief Executive Officer of Rockford Therapeutics PLC, which trades on the OTCQB venture market under the symbol ROQAF and on the LSE under the symbol ROQ. Welcome, Ajahn. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. So without further ado, I'm going to take us through these slides. Um, just to repeat, the company's Rockfort Therapeutics, and I'm the CEO, Ajahn Reginald. So a quick company history. Rockfort Therapeutics was founded in 2020 and listed on the London Stock Exchange in 2021. In December 21, Rockfort acquired Lyramid, which is an Australian-based company, a biotech company, that was developing a, a range of anti-cancer medicines for a novel target called Midkine. And then in September 22, Rockfort acquired Oncogenie Limited, another UK company, which was developing cell and gene therapies. From this, Rockfort has developed a portfolio and is highly focused. The area that Rockfort has focused in is in cancer therapeutics. So Rockfort is a biotech company developing medicines for cancer and particularly for the hard to treat cancers. That's the cancers um, that are not treated well with existing therapies and for which patients sadly still have a poor prognosis. Um, Rockfall has a portfolio of innovative preclinical medicines, um, which include antibodies, RNA therapeutics, mRNA therapeutics, and cell therapies. The leadership team, which we'll go through in a moment, includes Sir Martin Evans, who won the Nobel Prize for his research, um, experienced drug developers, and for, and people with a number of years of corporate experience, both in the US markets and internationally. We believe Rockford presents an, a significant value potential because, because of our ability to identify early technologies and early innovation and to develop that for sale. Sorry, having a slight IT problem here. Just lost the slides. There we go. Um, just move it on. There we go. So a little bit about our strategy. So where Rockfort specializes is in identifying early innovation. Our business model is to identify early innovation in high value areas. So this is again in oncology in very early oncology, what we're looking to do is to identify new, new products in the high value market niches, develop those and package them in a mechanism in a way that is ready for big pharma to acquire. The reason this strategy is particularly interesting is because oncology cancer therapeutics is an extremely interesting and attractive market currently. So in the world of biotech and pharma, oncology therapeutics are the fastest growing market. One of the sub niches that we focus in is metastatic cancer. So those are cancers that have spread. And even within that, that niche within the cancer market, the metastatic cancer market is worth about $15 billion and growing with a 10% CAGA. So Rockport, Rockport Therapeutics as an early biotech company identifies these early opportunities in these high value niches and then develops them and packages them in a way 
that is very attractive to potential acquirers. Most companies in biotech, small companies in biotech, are acquired by big pharma companies. So Rockford is a specialist in identifying early innovation, developing it and packaging it for potential acquirers in big pharma. A little bit about our team. You know, why do we feel we have the experience and the skill set required to be able to take this early innovation and to package it and complete the development steps required to be able to then put it into a format that's appealing to Big Pharma? Well, part of that comes from practical experience. So, Sir Martin Evans who we've highlighted here is a Nobel Prize winner with more than 50 years experience in biotech and pharma. Armin Keating is a well-known physician scientist based at the University of Toronto, um, who again has got that practical experience of having taken medicines from just an early idea into clinical trials. So through that value inflection point where you're, you're taking something which is early innovation, often from a university, and developing it to a point where it can be um, packaged properly for big pharma to be able to use it. Um, Dr. Darren Disley is a very experienced chief executive officer um, of, of public companies and now a board director of public companies um, with, again, um, experience and, and expertise in biotech and pharma. Darren has a, a PhD from the University of Cambridge. Dr. Michael Stein is a former Rhodes Scholar uh, as an MD, PhD from the University of Oxford and someone who has spent more than 30 years in biotech and pharma. Um, Simon Sinclair is another non-executive from the University of Cambridge, uh, another MD, PhD who works for the multi-billion dollar company Rectin, uh, Reckitt as a chief safety officer. And then Throwing back again, uh, and then uh, Jean Duval is an intellectual property expert who works in biotech and also uh, has very specific expertise in intellectual property within the biotech field. And then my background, so I've got more than 20 years experience in biotech and pharma. Um, I was chief executive of, of a, a biotech company now for the, for the last 14 years in private companies. During COVID, I worked at Novasite, which is a UK listed company, um, where I was chief operating officer and chief technical officer. And prior to all of that, I worked for Roche, the big pharma company, where I was M&A director and then global head of new technologies. My academic training is at the University of Oxford. Um, and in, in, I'm very pleased to have lived in the United States. In, I lived in Chicago. Um, where I studied at Northwestern, um, Kellogg Business School, and then at Harvard Business School. So our, our board has a lot of practical expertise as well as um, theoretical expertise, and it's that practical expertise that we bring to bear in this ability to identify early uh, innovation and then take it through the inflection points, the value driving points, to get it ready to be acquired by Big Pharma. So I've taken you through our value creation cycle. I think the key part of this is that it's a sustainable business model and a sustainable process. So we're able to identify innovation very early. We, we know how to develop that innovation, take it through the steps required to create value. And the, and the key inflection point that we're looking for is we're taking this, these, these early medicines through the steps required for, and then packaging them ready so they'll be ready to go into a clinical trial. When we look at the data over the last 20 years, so between 2005 and 2020, around 330 companies were acquired at this very early, this preclinical stage of development. And the average valuation of those companies was $71 million. So that's our benchmark. You know, we, we believe for each of these individual compounds that we're developing, the average valuation over the last um, 20 years is around $70 million. And that's our sort of re a replicable business model to find very early innovation and to develop it through preclinical development ready for sale 
to large pharma companies. And, and the sort of specific expertise that we have is, is both the networks, we understand what Big Pharma is looking for, um, as well as understanding who to speak to in Big Pharma. You know, there are, there are key elements of the strategic decision making in, in terms of how you select a product. And then once you've selected the right product, how you develop it and package it in a way that's ready um, to be very, to be seen to be very attractive by potential acquirers. Again, this is the, the data I just talked about. So what you see is the, the medium, um, median upfront payment in a licensing deal for, for individual products that we're developing is around $30 million uh, and the mean was over $100 million. And the individual asset valuation for each of the products in our class, which is the first group here on the left-hand side where it says preclinical, is around $70 million. So what we're able to do is to identify innovation very early, take it through a very structured development process, um, and then hopefully get it to a point where we can realize value um, at this average valuation. So in Q4 um, of last year, we put the foundations in place. So we put our portfolio together, we completed an acquisition, and we conducted a strategic portfolio review. Now in Q1, we've started three different tracks. So the first is that we're looking at outlicensing. We completed our first outlicensing deal in February of this year, um, where we were able to outlicense some of our non-strategic portfolio to um, Randox, which is one of the, the, the largest diagnostic companies in the UK. Um, and then we've also continued our internal R&D and drug development um, process. What we've been able to do there is to develop a, a fifth asset, which is called, uh, which is an mRNA asset. Uh, we're probably all familiar with mRNA from um, the Pfizer and Moderna BioNTech vaccines, but mRNA was originally conceptualized for use in cancer. And so what we've been able to do is to develop an anti-cancer mRNA that we, we announced this week. In parallel to that, we've been developing external R&D and through a network. And that network includes these five institutions. So one in North America in, in Toronto at the Keating Lab, um, and then the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Institute, the Lowry Cancer Institute, the Hawkins Laboratory, um, and also Sydney University. So through that external network, we're able to develop programs in parallel. So this is very really a scalable model, you know, by using high quality leading ca academic cancer centers were, late, were able to develop multiple programs in parallel. A little bit about the first licensing deal that we did. So we completed the Randox deal in February. The total transaction value is around five million pounds and it's really to develop clinical diagnostics. Clinical diagnostics are critical for cancer because they enable us to diagnose patients early and also to diagnose patients that would um, benefit from our therapy. You know, our, our goal at Rockford is to try to develop medicines that can help these patients that have um, the poor, the poorest prognosis. And so by developing early diagnostics and hopefully rapidly um, accelerating our drug development, we hope to be able to bring targeted medicines to the market that will help these patients that have the worst prognosis. For us to remain focused on therapeutics, having a partner like Randox is very important because they will focus on developing the diagnostic. So for us, this is a, a very efficient and effective way of developing the, uh, the companion diagnostics that we need to, to help our therapeutics um, come quickly to market. And as you'll see in the middle box here, um, this synergistic relationship also has a, a significant benefit in terms of the likelihood of a medicine getting to market. It nearly doubles the likelihood of our medicines getting to market. So we'll go through the programs um, quickly. So we have a, a, an antibody program, which targets a novel target called midkine, uh, an oligotherapeutic, which also targets midkine, an siRNA, which is another type of siRNA medicine, which targets a novel target called STAT6, and then a cellular therapy, which targets um, which is a mesodermal killer cell therapy, 
and then a midkine mRNA. And I'll go through each of those uh, briefly. So our midkine antibodies are currently in development and they are able to kill solid tumors. So what this data is showing you in the pictures is that when we treated um, two different types of, of cancer with our antibodies, what we're able to see is a very significant reduction in metastases. And, and this is key because metastases is, is one of the key reasons we have a poor prognosis for many cancers. So we're, you know, modern medicine has really improved in our ability to be able to treat primary cancer, so the first tumor. But once the cancer spreads, then the prognosis becomes much worse. What we've been able to show in preclinical studies with our uh, antibody treatments is that we can reduce the, metast the metastases. So what you'll see here in the in the graph is that the lung metastatic metastatic index reduces dramatically. So what that's saying is the number and the size of the metastases to the lung are dramatically reduced. And if this could be re you know if this could be repl replicated in patients then this would be a significant benefit. So if you could imagine if, if you've got a, a patient that has been diagnosed in this case with breast cancer and you can reduce the metastases that go to the lung, then the likelihood of that patient having a successful treatment increase enormously. We've progressed two programs, ROC A1 and ROC A2, uh, and we focused those um, treatments in breast cancer and metastases to the lung. The reason for that is because these treatments uh, will then help these patients that have the worst prognosis. So today, even with the best medicines, we still have um, only a 70, sorry, we, we have only a 30% survival rate at five years. So 70% mortality at five years um, for metastatic disease. And that's why we focused our therapies in this area. The next treatment is a midkine oligonucleotide. And what you can see in these very dramatic pictures is at the top there where it says full length midkine. These are, these are real tumors. So this is what the, this is the size of the tumor before treatment. And then what you see below uh, in under the blue heading is what the tumors look like or, or these tumors look like after treatment. So what we're able to see is that we can dramatically reduce the size of uh, tumors using this oligonucleotide treatment. Um, and just to reiterate, these are solid tumors. So these are tumors that are most difficult to treat. And that's why we focused our therapies on these areas. So again, our, our niche that we're looking for is, in this case, solid tumors that have a very poor prognosis with existing therapies. And what we were able to demonstrate in this experiment is that at 25 days, which hopefully you can see on the graph there, you can dramatically reduce the size of these tumors. The STAT6 sRNA is a, attacks another target, which is called STAT6. Uh, and, and STAT6 is a target um, that we've picked in, again, solid tumors. Um, so big cancers like colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer. Because STAT6 is um, part of the cancer metabolism, which allows the cancer to proliferate and expand. And what you can see in this first graph is that we can shrink the size of cancers with which express STAT6 very dramatically, you know, from an average of over three grams down to, to less than a gram. Um, and what you can see at 21 days, we can see more than a 45% reduction in the size of these tumors. And again, if we can replicate this in, in humans, then this is a, a significant um, benefit to patients. The MK cell therapies is really at the cutting edge. So this is this is one of the, the great hopes that we're looking at in, in cancer therapies at the moment. We're hoping to be able to produce cellular medicines that enhance the, the body's own immune system. And this is an extremely hot area of medicine at the moment. As, as it says down here, in May of last year, Gilead um, did a deal with a company called Dragonfly Therapeutics um, for preclinical, so the same stage as us before they'd gone into the clinics, so a preclinical um, treatment for $300 million. So this is a really hot area in cancer. And what we can see is that our MK cell therapy is able to have an effect both on directly killing cancer, so that's this cytotoxicity on the right-hand side, 
but also on priming natural killer cells, so priming the body's own immune system to kill cancer as well. And finally, the mRNA anti-cancer therapy that we've just announced. So we announced that this week. mRNA is this new area of medicine that, you know, prior to the, the pandemic, we weren't um, expecting would really be at the forefront for over a decade. But during the pandemic, this technology has been really accelerated. And as a consequence now, a number of companies have mRNA uh, medicines. Again, another very, very hot field um, at the moment in terms of licensing and acquisitions with Moderna and Merck doing a, a deal for $250 million in uh, Q4 of last year, just for one, you know, for a licensing deal. That was a little bit later than ours, but certainly gives you a sense that this is another field which is very, very hot in, in cancer therapeutics. So our, our mRNA will um, focus in the solid tumor market niche. And we're looking again at, tr at cancers that are very poorly treated currently. This is highly synergistic with our oligo treatment, and therefore we can develop this highly effectively and, and highly efficiently. So in summary, you know, Rockfort Therapeutics uh, it is a preclinical uh, cancer therapy company. We focus on identifying early innovation, and we have the expertise and the track record of developing that innovation and packaging it in a way that's in a way that's highly appealing to acquirers. We have partnered with leading academic centers around the world to accelerate and to leverage our expertise to be able to develop multiple programs. We have five fully funded products uh, programs, each of which which each of which contains more than one candidate. So we have over 10 shots on goal. We spent Q4 of last year establishing the foundations and the team to deliver our R&D and commercial milestones. In Q1, we've already delivered positive results from our antibody programs and announced um, our mRNA programs, as well as the first commercial milestone, which is our £5 million deal with Randox for diagnostics. The the company's focus is on developing these early innovations. So taking them from an early, you know, a good idea into something which is a tangible medicine. And the valuation over the last 15 years for products in that preclinical stage of development is $71 million. So our near term goal is to develop programs to that point and then to license or to sell those assets. Excellent. Well, that's 23 minutes. Um, so that leaves us with about five minutes or so for, for questions. So I'm very happy to take your questions. So the, the first question is, at what stage of development would you consider, consider selling a portfolio company? So our, our defined strategy is to, to sell these programs at the end of preclinical development. So we aim to have at least one program ready by the end of this year. Um, and then the next question is, what are your key milestones for 2023? And does your capital position support these initiatives? Yes, very much so. So we have sufficient funding to, to uh, complete the development all of all of our programs. So all five of our programs are fully funded to the end of the milestone that we're looking for, which is the end of preclinical development, at which point they are ready to be um, sold or outlicensed. Um, we have another question, which is, what is, what is your teams and your track record in delivering drugs? Um, so I've taken two medicines, sorry, three medicines in total. I've taken three medicines from just a good idea into clinical development. Um, so two of them are into um, phase two clinical trials, and the third one is, is ready to start a phase one clinical trial. Um, prior to that, I was an um, M&A director at Roche Pharmaceuticals, where I acquired a number of companies like Rockfort Therapeutics. Um, my largest deal, which is in the public domain, was the Alnylam transaction, which was $1.3 billion. And then um, I've done about a dozen more, which are 
in the sort of 100 to $500 million range, and then probably another dozen, which are smaller transactions, more in the um, in the sub 100 million. The team um, that we've got working at Rockfall Therapeutics includes a number of people that I've worked with for, for nearly a decade who have helped me um, take those medicines from, as I said, just a very early concept, a very early idea into clinical trials. Um, and then let's ask another question. Um, so the other question is around exits and examples of value creation. Um, so there are uh, two in the public domain. So one is uh, my previous company where investors were able to um, invest at one pound and were able to then sell their shares um, in a transaction with a big pharma company at 101 pounds. Um, that was about six years later. Um, and then another round of investment where investors were able to um, sell shares at about a three and a half to four X after two years. Um, I'll just go through the next question. So our most, what is our, the question is, what is your most advanced program and when do you think you will realize value from it? So our most advanced programs are the antibody programs that we just described. So those programs are now completing efficacy studies. And our hope would be that we would look to outlicense those programs by the end of this year. We've already started discussions around those programs and we're waiting for data in Q2 and Q3. So, so the way this sort of works is in, in Big Pharma, where I used to work, you have a, a sort of checklist of things that you're looking for. Uh, and, the, and the key things are, number one, do you have a, a candidate medicine, a program which is in the right area? So it is, is it in a high value niche, like the area that we focused in, which is the high value um, cancer niches where, where therapies currently don't work. The second criteria is, you know, it has this candidate medicine been developed properly. So has it been developed um, using validated models, using all the experiments that you would like to see if this was being done in a big pharma company? I think that's where we had a lot of value because that's obviously the background and the experience that we have. Uh, and then the third part of this is around intellectual property. So do you have the requisite intellectual property to, to own this medicine? So, um, and again, that's an area that we, I think, have a lot of expertise in. You know, I'm the inventor on over 100 patents um, and, and the, each of our medicines is protected by a composition of matter patent. Um, so, so I think the key, the key pit for us is we, we don't have any red flags. So we have all of the, the medicines packaged appropriately ready to be acquired. We're waiting for the data packs now to demonstrate that efficacy. So uh, another question is how did you finance acquisitions of the portfolio companies? So um, the, the two acquisitions that were done previously, the Oncogeny acquisition was an all share acquisition. So Oncogeny um, was acquired for shares plus there was also a fundraising round of a million pounds um, that went along with that acquisition. Um, and then last couple of questions. The one que the next question is, do you expect much more news flow over the next six months? Uh, yes. So we, you know, typically um, we have milestones every one to two weeks, you know, with five programs that are delivering data on time, you know, on, on schedule and within budget, um, our sort of natural cadence is that we have material news at least every two weeks. Um, this week has either been a good week or a bad week. We've had um, three announcements this week of uh, material events. So I've got time for one more question, if there's an additional question at all. No? In that case, I will take the opportunity, if I may, just to very quickly summarize. So Rockfort Therapeutics is a biotech company focused on developing next generation medicines. We genuinely believe in the synergy of developing medicines for patients that have the least options today. And if we can help these patients that have a poor prognosis, then we're able to you know, create medicines that are, that are highly commercially attractive. Uh, and I think that's where I'd leave you with this synergy between good business um, makes for good medicines, which I think help patients and therefore helps you as potentially